Derek uh, tonight. Um, and uh, we're going to ask him to, uh, well, first of all, let me let me say a word. Uh, Derek's going to join us uh, for his field work at seminary for the next, well, I guess, from August through early spring, I believe, uh, Derek. And uh, he'll be working with this group. He has some goals. We'll have some goals with him. Dawn will have some goals. I'll have some goals. And we'll see if he gets uh, his all done and all's all done before he, uh, before he has to leave us. Um, but I do want to, at this point, uh, uh, thank him for being with us. And he's kind of managing and watching the chat tonight. There are some things in chat that, uh, that Dawn's put there, some links that'll be helpful to you for resources and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, Steve Morton, our DS from North District, and uh, James Brown, our conference treasurer, uh, available to us to ask questions, particularly on financing. Uh, so let's uh, uh, let's get started. Before we get there, but though, uh, Derek, would you uh, open us with a word of prayer? Sure, thank you. So uh, before I do, some of you I know, some of you we will get to know as we go on this journey together, developing a small church network, and especially uh, my passion is for bivocational pastors. Um, so I am a bivocational pastor and, and have been for the last five years. So as we all journey together and learn how to be tonight, good, be good stewards of finances, but also kind of develop our skills to do better ministry and to just be more effective in the work that we do. I just welcome all of you. And if you need anything, please reach out to me via email and I'm happy to help out as best as I can. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we come together tonight, not only to, to, to be good stewards, to learn to be good stewards, but to be uh, better and more effective at the ministries that you have you put before us, dear Lord. Um, unfortunately, we know that, that uh, ministry costs money, and so we're all looking for better ways of, of pooling resources together, of finding new resources, of, of just doing what we can to be as effective and, and, and empowering as we can in the communities in which we serve. So Lord, be with us tonight. Open our minds to new possibilities, to ask good questions, to walk away with something new, something challenging that we can take back to our churches that will help us to dream big for your glory. So Lord, we, we just ask that you be with us today and that, we, that everything, all the, the conversations are just uh, empowering and, 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 um, and just filled with knowledge and wisdom that will help us to grow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. <clears throat> Denny, just unmute. Before we go to uh, uh, to Stephen to James, uh, let me put a pitch in for our next meeting because uh, I know some of us have to leave. But and in our September meeting, which is on the 14th of September, we'll be hearing from Reverend Steve Petty. Petty, uh, Steve is a retired pastor and coach from San Clemente. He's done church starts. He's worked in small churches. He's worked in large churches. He has a podcast, and part of the reason we're looking at him and asking him to come with us is we talked at our very first meeting about the difference between cats and or, or cats and, and collie churches. Steve really has some done creative some creative work on it and taking it to the next step. He's a great understanding of Schaller's model, has a great understanding of Schaller's model, and what he's basically done is say, okay, now here's how you pastor in a church like this. You're going to talk about change. Here's how you do it. And he, he even did one uh, for the whole series on coming out of the pandemic and coming back and what the pastor's role needs to be. So that's kind of exciting for me. Uh, he'll join us from San Clemente. Uh, it's a little earlier out there than it is here, but I think you'll be uh, I think you'll be rewarded by being a part of that uh, a part of that uh, uh, session. Um, before, again, before we get to uh, Steve and, and James, uh, Jeanette Penman, are you here? If you're here, can you unmute? I'm here. Jeanette, do you want to ask your question of the group? Um, I'm the finance secretary for Prospect United Methodist Church, which is in Prospect Park, Pennsylvania. And um, July is the month where you do your quarterly 941 report for the Fed. Uh, we've been doing it by filling out the report, printing it, and a certified mail sending it in. So I was looking online to see if there's a way to do it electronically, 
and the screen says that you have to have software and you have to buy the software and then it shows you a list of where you can buy the software from and the list is probably 20 different companies i was just wondering if anybody uses an electronic way to to um submit their 941 federal quarterly report anybody doing it silence isn't good <laughs> if you want to speak you have to unmute i haven't done it i have not i we now have a service we have a payroll service we work with paychecks but I've been doing the books for 30 years. Uh, when I did do it by myself, when I kept track of all that stuff by myself, I know that I went directly to the IRS and I filed there. I didn't mail anything in. I don't know if you're still allowed to do that or not, but I would, I'm sure there's a workaround. I think you need to have an ET, what is it? ETPS uh, account uh, to do that. Uh, but that's, I think I've done it that way before for other organizations, not for the church. Danny, if I may, the, sure. what the IRS website actually is saying is, here, with me one second, that uh, yes, you can submit the forms yourself, but uh, you need to purchase the IRS approved software okay. and a list of, provide, of, of providers are, are uh, shown there. Yeah, you see that list? I was hoping that somebody like TurboTax or something I recognize would be on there, but there, there's nothing. I wouldn't know which one to pick. And I was hoping that somebody else was already using something. Uh, uh, Jeanette, this is a germane question for everybody. How many employees do you have? One part-time pastor. Yeah. Well, we I, I don't see anybody rushing into uh, to save us on this topic here. Uh, Denny, I, yeah. I have um, I have three on staff and for four years we have outsourced to an organization to take care of that take care of payroll it's called prime pay okay well that's one of the topics we're going to have uh, tonight uh, anybody else use anybody else prime pay is one of the one of those uh, providers on the IRS website Okay. Now, Shirley, do, do you source all of your payroll to them or is it just uh, your uh, filing of the 941s and, and returns? They take care of everything. everything. It's been a delight, mostly because we um, didn't have the skills and the talent amongst us. And so that was the first step for our church to outsource and they were kind of scared. We all now love it. Do you know how much you pay? Um, I don't. I did. I don't. Okay. But apparently it's doable because we've had them for four years. I work with another or another small organization. I know James has a resource for us for, uh, for paychecks as well. Uh, but I work with paychecks. I work with a couple of other agencies for a club that I belong to. And uh, uh, we're using paychecks. We have one regular employee. We have, a, we have a, several uh, 1099 employees who we just pay directly and they're self-employed essentially. Um, and uh, I think it costs us about $100 a month. That includes all of our tax filings. And James, do you have some information on the general board? Or so that was, called, that was called paycheck. The other one's called prime pay? Yes. yes. Okay. Prime, Prime Pay is out of Westchester, so it's relatively local. Okay. Paychecks is, is a nationwide entity, and uh, Westpath uh, had, had uh, about a year or so ago, had, um, was trying to push out to local churches, um, going with Paychecks, and the one, the one thing they were trying to do with that and it became a moot point in Eastern Pennsylvania um, was if you went with paychecks, you, you could receive up a 35% discount on the services, but it also would, would um, 
uh, commingle or interact with uh, the pension. So the clergy pension, uh, any or UMPIP that came out of their pay payment, out of their checks, um, or even staff, if you have staff who, who are part of the pension plan, they, they would send the funds off to uh, directly to uh, Westpath based on, you know, based on what your information in the system was. Um, now, in April of this year, uh, the, the Eastern Pennsylvania Conference became part of a pilot program with Westpath, where uh, I don't know if any of you have clergy who have pension um, on staff, but you may have seen a new item go into your remittance form. It was basically the, if they were having the, um, the payroll deduction, you used to send it directly to Westpath. Now it shows up on your remittance statement and you send it to the, to the annual conference for clergy. And then we submit that on a monthly basis uh, with the rest of the uh, pension items. Uh, but that was one of the selling points that, that Westpath had put into this uh, when, they, when they partnered with, with Paychex. And, um, and now they're kind of going away from the um, direct bill of, of the pension items to the local churches and, uh, and, and having that bill through the annual conference. So, I mean, that was just one, one of the benefits, but, but you, you know, the paychex system, you, you know, they could do the file tax filings for you. That's all, most of it's done electronically, as long as you have, you know, the proper tax ID numbers or t proper account numbers at the federal state and local levels. Uh, they do have a pack tax pay service for um, you know, that they, that they provide and uh, the, the annual conference actually has been with Paychex since 2011, I believe. They were, they were with Paychex, when, well, 2010, because they were with Paychex when I arrived in 2010. And let me say I think, this, I, I don't know, if you get a price from, from Paychex through uh, Westpath, you might want to also contact them locally because I find that many times they, they'll negotiate with you at a, for a better price than you can get any place else. Um, so, uh, okay. Uh, okay. And, and one, one of their selling points is, another selling point that they have is, is they, are, they have expertise in, in unique needs of church payroll. So that includes the church, the clergy housing allowance or exclusions, um, but, it also really depends on who your rep is. You, you know, you want to make sure that, that they do are aware of how um, clergy compensation and payroll uh, does work. Um, so I, I, I have seen in, in some instances where they said, well, no, you have to pay Social Security Medicare regardless. I'm like, no, we do not because the clergy uh, do not do that. They do a self-employment tax. So um, but, but yeah, for the most part, they do have the expertise and, and being able to, uh, provide, you know, the, the pay, you know, the, the, do the payroll, uh, for the churches and all the tax filings. And you should be able to negotiate that in, with the sales department in the context of making sure you have the right person. The one disadvantage I've seen with paychecks is in one year, I think I had four different representatives because the company is so big, there's a lot of opportunity for people to move up the ladder. Uh -huh. and, and so that's a, that's a real disadvantage. You get used to somebody, it gets working, and, and then they, they move and you got to start over with a new rep. Right. Okay. okay. No, no and, and, but we- Sounds just like need... the way we appoint pastors, Danny. Uh -huh. I, we're not talking about that tonight, are we? No, that's not the okay. I'm sorry. I will yeah. go back to mute. That's okay. We we, we have we Ouch. you know we have been dealing with the paychecks office actually right in our complex, um, and yeah, I guess in the ten years we probably had about four different reps, but we changed our plat the platform three times. When I, when I first arrived, the the payroll was being called in over the phone, uh, and then we went to one where we created the file, sent the file in, and then they would release it once it's there. The, 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 uh, 
platform we're on now, it's actually kind of real time. Once we send it, payroll is done. So, uh, you know, we really depend on the platform you're in. I'm actually, I'm going to put the uh, link to the, um, you know, to the Westpath page, talking about paychecks, into the chat, and uh, you, know, you can look at it at your leisure. Thank you. Very good. Okay. This is my first time doing this, so I hope I, hopefully I do it right. Oh, it looks like somebody already did. <laughs> but there it is. Very good. Um, so, James, do you have anything else that you'd like to address? Uh, I know we talked about the West Path thing, and uh, are there other uh, concerns? We're ta we'll take questions. If yeah, you want to, uh, Don, how do we want to do that? Uh, put them in a the chat or uh, raise a hand or what? Do you want Steve to go, and then we'll do questions for them both? If James, uh, I, here, let, let's do that. Yeah. And, but we'll still need to decide how we're going to folks are going to get our attention. I'll let you work on that. Hello, Steve. Hey, good evening, folks. Thank you so much for uh, for, for jumping in here tonight. You got a good crowd. Um, I am the North District Superintendent right now, but uh, I've been uh, 34 years in this annual conference and three different appointments. So, you know, I've been I've been where you've been in terms of uh, you know the issues of uh, of stewardship and financial development. I am much stronger on that side of things than I am on some of the accounting and reporting stuff where, where uh, you know, James and some others could be helpful to you. But um, uh, yeah, thank you for being here and thank you for, uh, for what you do in the, in, the, uh, in the life of the local church. Um, I have never uh, shied away from this whole topic of uh, financial development in the life of the, uh, of, of the local church. And, and uh, what, what I ask of, uh, of, of, uh, of pastors is, and church leaders, maybe some of you are not pastors, is, is the same for you, that you address this reality Derek you know offered in his prayer this sort of confession that you know good ministry uh, you know uh, costs money well th that's not something we need to confess we understand that ministry costs money we're called in the gospels to share the words well I mean we we you know we get that but what we need to confess is the difficulty of of raising you know money from uh, from the people whom whom we work with um, but some general principles about financial stewardship in the life of the church, and you hear me say this, whether it's large church, small church, whoever it is, is that I'd absolutely want you to um, approach this whole conversation in the context of always uh, that financial giving is a spiritual discipline, a spiritual discipline. And we're going to talk a little theology here. Hope we can go there. When I talk about spiritual disciplines, we're talking about those practices of the faith that make us more like God, more Christ-like, and draw us closer to God. Uh, in a Wesleyan tradition, we would talk about means of grace. Anybody know, is that familiar? Means of grace. What are the means of grace in our churches? We talk about Holy Communion. We talk about worship. We talk about Bible study. We talk about solitude. We talk about fasting. We talk about uh, service to others. Almsgiving, giving is spiritual discipline. That's why it's your business, pastors and church leaders, to be promoting this, pushing this all the time, because this is a spiritual discipline that makes us more like God and draws us closer to God. We're in the business of disciple making, and, and, and so we need to be putting, you know, this, this uh, sharing of financial resources in the same context that we do all the other means of grace uh, in, 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 in our traditions. Um, and so this has always got to be a theological work. It's always got to tie into our primary business of disciple making. And we are absolutely not apologetic for that. In fact, that's what you're called to do and to do and to do, you know, uniquely and do and to do thoroughly. So, you know, I don't really talk about raising money, but I talk about helping people to grow in their discipleship through the practice of the spiritual discipline of almsgiving, of tithing, of giving, and always keep it uh, in that context. What that means is your stewardship conversations have got to be year round. They're going to be all the time. And they've got to be in every medium and form. And they've got to slip into every conversation, just like your conversation about prayer, about worship, uh, 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 about Christian conferencing, about fasting. Uh, about Bible study, just like those things, 
will slip into your conversation, your preaching, your newsletters, your meetings, your, you know, so should you also be talking about this issue of financial stewardship and giving. It's got to be all the time. It makes me crazy when, when I ask pastors about their stewardship program and they'll tell me, yeah, they did the stewardship sermon the second week of October. Nah, we did it. You know, you, you, guys, you got to be able to find, you got to be finding stewardship themes uh, in, in the scriptures all the time. And, and it's got to be punctuating your, 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 your sermons and your, and your, and your Bible study um, all the time. You don't dwell on it all the time, but just like you talk about prayer all the time, you talk about the value of Holy Communion, uh, you talk about Christian conferencing, you talk about fasting all the time. You should be talking about this as a spiritual discipline that makes people more godlike and brings people closer to God. So it's all the time. It's all the time. It's, it's, it's year round. It's got to be positive. It's got to be positive. Don't apologize ever when it comes to these matters of financial stewardship and, and you know, the need for funding the ministry, but the need for people to give. Again, if it's a spirit, don't apologize for asking people to pray more. Don't apologize for asking people to participate in Holy Communion more. Don't apologize for inviting people to fast more often. Don't apologize for asking people to give as a way of becoming Christ-like and drawing closer to Christ. So we're always gotta be talking about, it's gotta be in the spirit of uh, thanksgiving, thanksgiving for blessings received, right? That this is where the, where this is where the greatest, you know, generosity and faithfulness occurs. Um, your task as the, as the administrative leader in these local churches is to help people put financial assets behind programs, we would call them ministries that connect to their deepest values. All fundraisers will tell you that. Their job is to help people put their financial resources behind whatever it is that floats their boat, you know? Uh, save the whales or Girl Scouts or the uh, Democratic Party or the whatever, whatever, you know? That's what we do. We give people opportunity to put their financial resources behind the stuff they really believe in. Well, in the life of the church, that should not be a hard thing to do. So keep it in the context of something that's always, you know, positive and and uh, and helping folks to grow in their discipleship. A couple of practices that number one rule in 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 financial stewardship success in the life of the church is you got to ask, <laughs> you got to ask, and 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 you got to ask, uh, you know, with a with a frequency. And when I say ask, what I mean is it give lots of opportunities for persons to give. Um, I practice, uh, you know, I came out of the local church three years ago, but I, I was, I was raised in that generation and I had success with, uh, annual pledges. Some of you may not be in those settings anymore, but that tends to work with, with older folks. But as I travel around our congregations and see who's there, I'm thinking that pledging, you know, the, 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 the annual pledging. Uh, is still something that uh, helps people become better givers, which is really what they want to be. Um, I'm also big on designated giving. And uh, designated giving means you pull a project out of the budget, or maybe it's something that's not in the budget. And for a short period of time, you identify, you ask people for second mile gifts that will go specifically for a cause, uh, a, a, a specific cause, um, and, and you got to be very careful about identifying a target that is attainable, not something outrageous, not something like, oh, we're gonna just going to do as much as we can. Um, but good fundraising will always assign a target where people find that reasonable for our context and they can understand where their gift is going to get a step closer to that attainable target. So we would do designated giving when I was at Hope uh, every month. We had a designated giving project. We would rotate them between mission project, a capital project, something on the building, and then something programmatic. And over the course of 12 months, we would have four of each of those. Because some people in your church just love to give to the building. And some people in the church just love to give to mission. And some people want to give to programmatic. I want to support the Bible school, the singles ministry, the bell choir, you know, and, and, and so you give them opportunities through the year. 
And in the midst of giving them those opportunities and putting those second mile giving uh, chances out there, also be very careful to say this, if this isn't for you right now, don't get, and don't feel badly about, about not giving. But there are some folks out there for whom right now they're passionate about this issue or, or, or God has blessed them right now and they're able to make a gift they couldn't, they couldn't make. And, and I'm asking you to consider this second mile giving. But, but, but I, I invite you to be really careful about saying to folks, I mean, my mom was one of those that every special offering went out, she thought she had to give to every offering and, and, and it made her you know, kind of crazy. Um, that's sort of guilt, guilt don't work. You know, so, 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 so take that away and say, if, if this is, if this, if this doesn't connect with the spiritual value for you right now, if this, if God isn't, you know, if you don't have anything extra right now, you are exempt. Thank you for what you do. But guess what? Others will flood to it. So give them lots of opportunities. And at the same time, give, give opportunity for those who are, you know, faithful givers to, to kind of opt out without any guilt. We don't want any guilt in, in, in our giving. Um, lots, you need lots of opportunity for give, but you also need lots of ways to give. When I was a young pastor, when Denny and I were young, there were two ways. Most of it came through the plate on Sunday morning, right, Denny? And then we checked the mail on Tuesday and we hoped some checks, <laughs> checks came in and then we, you know, worked till the, the offering next Sunday. Today, guys, there's lots of other means. Uh, I think we're all growing in terms of uh, giving people the tools to be the givers that they want to be. Uh, online giving, absolutely every church has got to be offering this. And James can tell you about even how the annual conference will help you there. Um, uh, your websites, there's got to be giving opportunities because a lot of people give episodically. You know, they give when the bonus comes in. They give when they get paid for their crops. They, you know, they give episodically, and so they got to be able to throw a chunk in, um, you know, off the off the website. They might not be in church on Sunday, and you know, more creative measures. I mean, are happening all the time. You know, whether it's with 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 texting or 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 Venmo or Zelle or all these new things. I didn't have a lot of success with that, but I would think that's probably the way the world is going with younger folks. My point is, you got to give them lots of different ways to give not just opportunities and projects to, uh, you know, to give to. Donors have got to be aware of the need. And so you, you, you've got to impress folks with, um, you know, where their money will make a difference uh, in ways that, again, conform with their particular values. And, and so I would say be very, very clear um, um, uh, 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 about the needs um, in, 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 in the life of the church. Now, I, I'm much bigger on, on talking about your need to give rather than giving for the church's needs. At the same time, I want to say to you, don't be shy about letting the broader congregation know sort of where we are financially. It just came from consulting with the church that's in a deep dip right now. And there's some, I was going to say good reasons. There's some tough reasons for that. But if everybody knew why their giving has dropped off, it's not because they're a sinking ship. Nobody wants to give to a sinking ship. I don't like those things in the bullet where every week we show, you know, how much we need to stay above water and how much came in. And every week we see that we get less than we need. That's a terrible medium. But if you can share with folks um, that some realities have happened, there's been a death, we had to replace the boiler, you know, we've got a bold mission we're doing. Folks, folks do want to know where their dollars are going, and they want to know that their dollars are making a difference. So, so, so cast the need very clearly, or maybe you'd say the goal or the vision, and also how their giving is going to make a difference. I want to believe that the five bucks I put in, the 50, the 500, is really going to make a difference in, in, in what you're describing. But don't assume your people understand you know, what the financial realities of the, uh, of the local church, uh, of what the local church are. And then lots of celebrations, lots of thank yous. Uh, any context of healthy financial stewardship is going to be a place where we are praising God uh, for the generosity of, 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 of folks. Um, uh, you, you know, folks can't be thanked enough. They can't be affirmed enough. Uh, pat it on the back. Uh, let them know you make a difference. 
Um, and, and, and we do that out of genuine uh, uh, gratitude and, and, and love for that for folks. And we also do that because we know we're going to be asking them again. I mean, that's just, that's, that's the way the cycle of, of ministries go. So I, I'm very pleased when I visit churches and I'm hearing pastors or leaders, it's better from a lay person, if they're saying, hey, thank you, gang, we raised X number of dollars and we got this done, we got that mission, we established this scholarship, we did whatever, um, and, and lots of celebrations and, and lots of thank yous, which just goes back to my first point about keeping it all positive and keeping it all about spiritual growth. Um, one, one, of the, one of the points I'd, 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 I'd make on this, on this issue of that this, is a, that this is a measure of spiritual growth and that we as pastors, talking to clergy now, are, are really responsible for discipling folks to help them to pray better, to fast more, to conference more urgently. Um, you know, we, we are responsible for helping them to be, to be better givers and, and to grow uh, in that spiritual discipline. One of, and I, can, I, I still find this to be problematic in local churches, is that there's some of our pastors who don't know the giving patterns of their members. And they say, I don't need to know that. That's private. That, 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 that's private. I would ask you, when did we buy into that heresy in the Christian church? I mean, it's not the scriptures I read, you know, that says what I do with my money is private. That might have to do more with where we live than the Bible we read. But you as pastors have got to be challenging people to grow spiritually. And, and a key issue in terms of, of knowing people's giving patterns is that you pastors are largely responsible for developing the leadership team in the life of your local church. And if you're aware of, of, of members of the, of the church who you know, choose to opt out of some of the spiritual disciplines of the faith, I'm hopeful you're saying to them, you know what? Great to have you in worship, and I hope you hang out with us, but uh, probably ought not to be the chair of the board. Someone says, you know what, that praying thing, yeah, that's for others, but I don't really believe in it, but I'll be your lay leader if you want. Uh, thank you, no, right? Thank you, no. That Holy Communion thing, yeah, I get it for others, but, you know, I think it's kind of a gimmick. I don't really believe anything happens in Holy Communion, but uh, sure, I'll be your finance chair. Uh, thank you, no, no. Someone says to you, yeah, tithing, you know, sacrificial givings, not for me. Thank you for coming to church. We're, we're delighted to have you. But you don't believe, belong in our lead team here. So, so I, I would, so for some of you, that's a challenge. I hope for a lot of you, that's an invitation to say, just like we, 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 we want to we know about the spiritual practices of, of our key leaders in all the other areas, we want to know about it in this area, in this area as well. I hope that doesn't throw us off of anything else I said, but there, I said it. Qu questions, comments, thoughts, where, where do you want to go with this, Dawn or, or, or Danny? Steve, uh, let, me, let me just respond to a couple of things, because uh, I, I know a little bit about stewardship. Uh, did it for about 14 years or more and helping churches raise uh, dollars above and beyond their budgets, uh, as well as in their budgets. Uh, I, think you're, I think you're very right in, uh, in, in saying we need to say thank you more. We also need to help people understand uh, the accountability of what we do with their money, that it's valuable, it's helping people. One of the things that I've, uh, I've come to do is I, I go on the conference website, I find out where the dollars that we give to the annual conference are going. And when it comes time for the offering, I talk about one of those projects. Right. We support the Zermans, for instance, in Nepal. Right. And so we'll talk about that. When we get a letter from them, we'll share that with them and say, this is what your money is doing. Right. Um, uh, we, we sent uh, uh, through the, uh, our congregation is small. So our average attendance right now is about 35, it was 41 before the pandemic. I don't know where we're going to end up. And that's in person and that I can identify online. I don't know who's watching us and how many people are watching us by YouTube. But, but you know, we collected lunches and laundry kits and, and uh, uh, clothing for the homeless in Pottstown. And every time we did that, I consecrated something from that gift that we took into Pottstown and talked about the lives that, was being, that were being touched by it, even in a small congregation. Uh, 
So, so that's, that's really important. People need to understand that. I think it's helpful to separate giving uh, from the budget. Uh, that is to say, I would not, and I don't do any more. Uh, as a matter of fact, doing a stewardship campaign in the church I'm, I'm at is almost moot because we always have money left over at the end of the year. And I don't, and we give uh, above, above the, uh, our giving to the conference and to our general stuff, uh, we, we actually commit $10,000 above that for our mission projects, yes. uh, locally and internationally and, and through the conference. And, and then everything that comes up, uh, uh, every ask that I've uh, given to the local congregation, we've, we, we've done, uh, we, we, we've uh, done that. But, but I think uh, it's important to, to help people understand not only what's, what's happening there, but to separate the general giving and the issue of stewardship from building a budget. So uh, a number of years ago, a, good, uh, a lot of years ago, and we've used this for a good number of years when I've done this, is to do the stewardship campaign in the spring. Mm -hmm. Do the budgeting campaign in the mm -hmm. fall mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. based upon what people told you that they would give them. That, that ends the begathon because you're framing the stewardship campaign in a spiritual piece. And I would never, ever again do a stewardship campaign in which I talked about uh, about what, what the church needs. Uh, I've learned in, in the capital work to ask people to ask themselves as, as you're challenging them to give, uh, to pray about what God wants them to do and to be responsive to what God wants them to do. Um, and, and really to ask three questions. Did I pray about it before I decide what I'm going to do? Did I pray about it? Is what I'm doing God pleasing? Does it really please uh, God? I, do I believe it pleases God in the relationship to what God's calling me and asking me to do? And then does it challenge me about, uh, above where I'm comfortable? Because that's where faith lives, taking the step that's beyond where we're comfortable. Uh, and, and I think that works in any size congregation. I am concerned, however, that we come, and, and this is a this is one of those pieces that we're unique in because we're mostly in small churches in this group, is at what point do we reach capacity? And that's a that's an excellent question to pose to the cabinet. You know, at what point do we do we get to the point where we're exceeding the financial resources? Now, even as I raise that question, let me tell you that in most of our congregations, there's much more money there than we get. Uh, there's there, they haven't been. Uh, many congregations have not been challenged. Some, e even the most unlikely people, are likely to come up with uh, because they uh, understand the need for something, will come up with dollars, even if it's sacrificial. I, I did a capital campaign in the Harrisburg area a number of years ago with with a local church. They were going to do a building, and and we were struggling with uh, the advanced gifts and how to get that funded. And I had a woman come up uh, and, and give the first commitment. She committed $5,000 to that campaign. It was the very first commitment we had. And after the meeting, the pastor and I talked about it, talked about her really. And he said, you, you don't really understand what this means to her. You know, she, um, uh, she's a widow. She has an adult mentally challenged daughter who gets SSI and she lives on social security. I don't know how many years they had to save for that $5,000. But when they prayed about it, they believed that God was asking them to participate in the mission of that church. They gave probably the greatest gift in that congregation. It wasn't a large gift for, by, by the stretch of what we needed, but it was a large gift because it was sacrificial. So folks will step up if they understand the need, if you've asked them to pray about it and frame it in that spiritual context that Steve was talking about. Danny, I want to make sure that uh, folks are aware of the conference online program. I think most are, but there could be someone here who's not. So James, could you just share a word about that? Absolutely. And, whoops. I was holding that chat in until I got a chance to speak about it. And I did actually put a link into the chat to the online giving page for the annual conference. 
the online giving um, was was started probably about a year and a half ago, maybe two, maybe closer to two years ago, and it's being paid for by a grant from the Mid Atlantic Foundation. So all the fees uh, that are being charged for for this online online giving is uh, is being paid for by the Mid Atlantic Foundation currently. Uh, and we have 51 churches uh, who are, are listed on the website that have signed up. They send in the, uh, send in the proper form to, to sign up. All four of our camps, um, the Camp and Retreat Ministry, which, uh, you know, through generosity last year, raised $70,000 for, for, uh, for the Camp and Retreat Ministry during the, during the pandemic. And then all our annual conference offering offerings are also on that page and all it takes to sign up and a number of churches on here might may already be signed up all it takes to sign up is to co complete the uh eft form we require uh that you know the the funds are sent out to the churches electronically it gets out to them a lot quicker we do the payments uh once a week on either thursday or friday so you have the funds in your account by monday as opposed to mailing the check and you know, and 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 the lag time for that. So, um, like I said, we have 51 churches signed up currently, and I'm not sure how long the grant for from the foundation is going to last. But you know, it is, it is you know the cost. There is no cost. Every dollar that comes in goes out to whatever church um, was you know was selected to receive the gifts. So. Um, now, if you have any other additional questions on it, you know, feel free to ask or, or you know, you can reach out to me at any time or even the accounting department and any one of us uh, at the conference office will help you with that. I don't have numbers on how, how, how much has gone out um, to, to the different churches, but I do see EFTs going out between five, three and $5,000 every week to, to uh, the local churches. That's great. Thank you so much. I'm thinking, Denny, we should just open the floor for questions because I think some folks came tonight with maybe um, some questions or what are you thinking about or dealing with in terms of finance? So whether it's, um, you know, I don't have a treasurer anymore or can two churches partner together? What are you thinking about that we can test Stephen James tonight? Ooh. Give them some hard uh, questions. Ooh. If if I could, uh, I would just kind of like to piggyback a little on what Steve was sharing, but also uh, in my role as being a disaster response team for the conference, uh, I would I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't emphasize the fact that Anytime there's a disaster, you will see things up about the Red Cross. And I've had people in the church say, well, we should give some money to the Red Cross to help with this disaster. The reality is that most of the time, any disaster that the Red Cross is involved with, the United Methodist Committee on Relief is involved with, and we actually give 100% through the advance to those things. And I've never forgotten years and years ago, I. I'm trying to think it wasn't at, at Hopewell, but somewhere uh, there was a training went on and I've never forgotten this story. And it was about uh, this guy who was the presenter said, you know, as, as a group, United Methodist are the second most generous givers in non-church giving and in charitable give causes. And he said, and one of the largest gifts, areas of giving is the American Heart Association and one of the places where that money goes is to this hospital that happens to be Methodist related and is advanced special, <laughs> you know, but a lot of our pastors, unfortunately, have kind of gotten the idea that, well, if I encourage them to send their money there, there won't be any money here. And I mean, I just go back to what Steve said. We have a generous God and it's really well past time for us to act like God stingy and, you know, and so we should be stingy about how we handle God's money. Uh, we, we really need to stress the, the generosity. And of course, Cliff Christopher used to do the talk about how at offering time, instead of announcing, now we're going to receive the offering, which everybody knows, get somebody up there to say, 
I want to thank you for the, the giving that you do to this because of that gift, we're able to do these things. And that people are more excited about that any day than if all you can say is, hey, I have some bills, could you please pay them? That puts us right in line with about a million other people. So enough of that, but just wanted to share that. That accountability that you're talking about, Rick, or, or Denny mentioned, again, is very, is, is very, very significant. Letting folks know where their dollars have gone and, and, and the difference they're making and the testimonies that uh, come from that. But I'm, I, I, I'm just as bold in saying to you testimonies from people who can tell you how they have grown as a disciple of Jesus Christ precisely through their giving. Is, 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 what, is what our church members want to hear and deserve to hear. You know, we're used to maybe testimonies from folks who come back from those mission trips or those disaster relief efforts. And what do they all say, Rick? I was the one who was blessed because I went. Well, that's what practicing spiritual, spiritual discipline does. We ought not to be surprised by that. How often do we hear, you know, some sort of testimony of, of folks about, about giving, you know, where, where they end up growing spiritually or learn, you know, that as, as one of my old members used to say, you can't outgive God. I mean, any, any of those kinds of things. Now, we, we we don't want to, I was going to get bragging and I mean, I get all of that, but pastors, you can find people who have the stories who can say, you know, we made this gift or we took this risk or whatever. And, 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 and God continued to bless us and bless us abundantly in the midst of that. All your members need to hear that. All your members need to hear that. And God needs to hear it too. Yeah. Steve, there's a, there's another dimension to, to, to this and that is I really can't expect my congregation to go someplace that I'm not willing to go. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Talk uh, about the leadership of the pastor. Yep. And so, you know, if I expect people to tithe, uh, I've got to tithe. Uh, and it makes a difference in the church. And I have no problem. Uh, I don't brag about it. But if anybody asks me, my wife and I give 15% of our income uh, to charitable causes, the bulk of it going to the to local churches or through local churches. Um, and, and, uh, but I can't ask anybody to do that if I'm not willing to take that faith step myself. And it does change lives, by the way. It changes priorities, it changes lives. Um, and there's, there's tons of stories uh, that folks can share with you uh, you know about that. And, and again, Dan, I'm going to say, I expect pastors to talk about the the spiritual growth that they gain by going deeper into their prayer lives. I expect pastors to talk about the 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 the, the joy of, of 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 holy communion at you know this setting or, or or that setting. Why would I not expect pastors to talk about the spiritual contentment that that comes from this practice of of tithing of alms giving and and leading the way and and, and leading the way by so doing. The the, the other piece to this, Steve, uh, for me is I need to, I need to, uh, in setting an example, I, I don't ask people to do what I'm not unwilling to do. So for instance, in my, uh, when I first came to the current church I'm, I'm at, uh, it wasn't long before we had a flood. And I talked with the missions folks about that they had, they done anything through, through uh, 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 UMCOR with flood buckets at that time, we were calling them. And uh, uh, they had, and I said, well, they said, yeah, we did that the last flood, uh, you know, we gave, I said, well, how many buckets did you do? And I knew the financial resources in the congregation at that point. And they said, we did, we did uh, a five. I said, what kind of goal did you set? And, and they said, uh, well, I think we, we got what we could. I said, well, let's go for 25. And then I pitched in for a good number of those buckets. To, and, and I gave my check first. Uh, because I know how people talk and I know what gets around, you know, when people can say we've already got a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars or whatever it is for this. And, and, you know, can we step up by the time that we had our second flood, that same congregation, an average attendance of 42 gave uh, uh, generated uh, dollars and supplies for 55 uh, uh, buckets. Now, that would not have happened if we hadn't stepped out on faith and said, we can do this because the Lord has blessed us this way. We can do this. So don't be afraid. Uh, at the most, you, you fall short. But think of what additional you would have raised 
over what you could have if you didn't ask at all. Other questions? We just pick up on that, Denny, about asking. I think uh, particularly around endowment and um, talking to people about their wills is another place where we often fall short and don't have the conversation. And so reminding people that just as they remember their alma mater in their will, the church is a place where their gifts are long lasting, right? And um, it's, it's that place where Jesus's mission continues. And so I started, it was actually for a long time, I didn't do this, but eventually I put in our newsletter, you know, if you want to leave a gift to the church, here's how you do it. Um, we began celebrating endowment giving. So people who would give, you know, we planted a tree in their memory or their honor. When someone would give to that fund, we would share it, right? We would proclaim it, like Steve said, with joy. So I think particularly knowing um, our membership, we need to be thinking about, right? They're going to plant a tree that's going to be there for generations to generations. And how do we say that and communicate that uh, regularly, that that's an opportunity? Because I'll tell you, my college they send it to me every month. They call Ooh. me. They, they, you know, they have reunions, and then they tell me again. You can support you your college, right? And so we wanna, we wanna give people that opportunity for. And Rick mentioned uh, Cliff Christopher, and he's kind of taught a lot of us the language of, and and Denny knows this well. You, you know, different ways to give, different pockets out of which people give. Those of us who do the, you know, the weekly offering thing and the, and the pledge campaign are uh, are appealing to folks who get a paycheck every other week, kind of thing. And then there are folks who who you know give out of assets. Um, and have something you, you, you know disposable that they might sell for a designated project or a capital campaign. Again, the kind of thing that Denny helped out a lot with. And then there's that legacy giving. That there's those folks that that can say in 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 their in their wills, um, in 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 planning from when they're no longer here. And for some folks, again, this is a joy. Some folks can 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 tithe for the first time in their wills. In their wills, they haven't been able to figure out the financial way. But 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 anybody, anybody in his or her will, you know, can 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 commit ten percent. Um, and I don't know if we talked about James has mentioned, you know, the resources of the Mid Atlantic Foundation, um, which is which is there to help local churches with all these forms of giving, but particularly that last one, the one that Dawn just mentioned. Uh, Mid-Atlantic folks would be glad to come out and talk to a group of churches or pastors or whatever about how do we give your folks resources for plan giving so that they can do in their legacies what in their soul they know they really want to do when it comes to assets and God's blessings. One of the things that we talked about early on was what happens when you when your personnel short when you don't have somebody in your congregation uh, that's uh, uh, that's gifted to be a treasure. You know, we talked about uh, 941s. Uh, one of my, uh, I was wondering how many of you, just raise your hand, how many of you know what a 941 is? Yeah, not everybody. Uh, and if you don't have somebody in your congregation who, nine, who doesn't know what a 941 is, you could be in real trouble uh, because it's what you have to file quarterly, as uh, Jeanette said, uh, relative to your payroll taxes. So I think there, there could be, and, and this is just a topic for future, just a, a kind of seed to see where it grows. There could be a, a, a need in the future for small churches to begin to look at each other and see what resources we have that we can share and perhaps do some things together, like churches in a, in a similar location, sharing a treasurer, perhaps even hiring somebody who, who has the capacity to do it and or, or hiring or going to a uh, to a uh, uh, to, to a company who can do it for you uh, accounting uh, I've had one or two churches that I served where the treasurer we well, never saw the treasurer because they were they worked outside of the church uh, but but you know we couldn't do that every place and as resources get as people resources get smaller that may be something that we're forced uh, forced to do we're at about what just about time to quit. I have one, uh, one other saying. I put one in the in the uh, in the chat. You know, if you don't ask, you if you do not ask, you will not get. If you don't challenge, you will not challenge people. 
Uh, the other one is if you always do what you always done, you always get what you always got. And, and uh, so we're talking about doing some things differently as we work down the road here. It's always easy to fall into the rut of doing things the way we've always done them. And all of us are pulled that way from our local churches or by local churches pulling on the cabinet. We've never done it that way before. The seven last words of the church. Uh, so, you know, we have to take responsibility and help folks break out of that in a loving, caring way for their own good, for their spiritual growth, because it's a matter of faith and stepping out. You got to get out of the boat if you're going to walk on the water. We have to take that step of faith. Donna, you, anybody, are the leaders here or presenters tonight have anything you'd like to use to wrap up? Denny, I just want to share with everyone, I want you to know that there are ministry grants in the conference available, and I really encourage you, if you have a new ministry happening, if you're doing something as we emerge from this pandemic, please, please fill out the Dewey's grant application. It is very simple. I placed in the chat our funding for ministry booklet. I'll put it in again for those of you who came on a little later. Um, the Dewey's grant is a one-page grant application. It's for new ministries. You send it to your district superintendent. There are other grants, though, in the conference. And in the funding for ministry booklet, it will tell you about these. So CDT, our congregational development team, Rick serves on that team who's here tonight. CDT does grants all year long. So for new ministries, if you're trying to reach new people, uh, CDT, you can apply to, you can send an email to Lloyd Spear and um, ask him for a grant application. And again, that's a rolling grant cycle. There are Peace with Justice grants available. They are also on a rolling grant cycle and not many people reach out to these organizations who are in our conference to share what you're doing, to share if you're doing a project and you need funding. Um, so please take advantage. Also, even our scholarships, if you have young people, there are incredible United Methodist scholarship opportunities, both in our conference, we have two different scholarship opportunities as well as denominationally. So I'll put that uh, page on the website in the chat. And if you scroll to the right on that page, you can look at the entire booklet, which will walk you through every grant opportunity and scholarship opportunity in the conference. And you'd be amazed that many churches don't, they don't ever apply or they don't think they're the right size church or whatever. A DS is not looking for that. We are looking for, are you trying something new? And we get very excited and Steve can speak to this. If a church is trying something new and trying to reach new people, um, so we want to work with you. And Anybody out there gotten any of these grants? Yeah, I mean, I know some on the North. So, I mean, talk to folks. Uh, and, and there are even more urban ministry grants, the new Norbeth uh, grant for social justice ministries. I mean, Dawn is aware of all, you know, many of these. And, and, and I would say we offer these as a way of promoting mission and ministry in your local context, because we, we believe that then promotes, um, you know, more activity and better giving. Um, you know, going forward for the life of your church. We're not looking at this as a way of funding ministry because we don't want your people to be good givers, but this is a way of promoting success and vitality. People love to give where they see something happening that's making a difference. Maybe one of these grants can kind of jumpstart, you know, your setting, your community, your congregation. Thanks, Steve and, and Don. Uh, James, any last words? I wasn't going to say anything about grants, um, so uh, I do want to. I do actually want to follow up on something Steve had mentioned earlier, and about the the local pastor. You know, the pastor knowing their congregation, and the discipline actually does um, reference that, and it's it's in uh, par or section three forty, or I guess paragraph three forty. No, section three forty, paragraph two. C to C or something, but it's it's basically you know saying to, to provide leadership for the funding ministry of the congregation to ensure membership care, including compliance with charitable giving documentation requirements, and to provide past, appropriate pastoral care. The pastor, in cooperation with the financial secretary, shall have access to and responsibility for for professional stewardship of congregational giving records. So. Um, it was, I was funny that Steve actually mentioned that because 
I was part of a email string earlier today that was talking about that same exact thing. And, and, and someone provided that, uh, discipline, you know, I don't uh, think I knew that was in the discipline. How about that? I got to read that book. I got to read that book sometime. All right. Right here. Good. Is that, yeah, I got one of those. All right. Hey, well, what's the, I, I, what's James, the James, paragraph? Yeah, James, no, where is the that? chat? We put all want to know the paragraph. Can you put that in the chat? <laughs> what the paragraph word is? Yes, because sometimes pastors need to point. <laughs> you know, that well, could be, that could be helpful. <laughs> okay. Where's that, from, James? I'll copy it from the email that uh, I had earlier today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, it thanks, took me about folks. three minutes to, to figure out exactly where it was because I kept looking. I'm like, I'm seeing 340. I'm seeing two. I'm seeing a bunch of twos, but it's 342 C2C. So that's the paragraph I just read to you or the section I just read. That's 3422. Two. No, 340. 340 2C 2C. Okay. Very good. But no, I, I again I just want to you know thank everyone for um, you know taking the time out tonight and, and invite me to to uh, be part of this. And uh, you know, if anyone has any questions, um, of all means, and one of, and one of those links, my my picture and and uh, phone number are actually in it. But but uh, you know, I, I am on the conference website. I you know I can put my number in the chat if anybody has any questions they want to call me um, and and discuss on on payroll or any other accounting type issues. Um, I'll put my, like I said, I'll put my number in the chat and and feel free to reach out to me. And again, thank, thank you for for having me tonight. James, Thanks, from James. your earlier days, do you have any of your recordings still available for on the site? Of you singing? There was, there was no days? recordings of singing. <laughs> in fact, in fact, I was told when I did it at an annual conference a couple of years ago, that's when the that's when the live feed went down. So praise the Lord. Apparently there's no there's no recordings of me. Well, folks, we're, we're glad you're all here, including James, and we're sorry you're not singing tonight, James, even though I think it's being recorded at this point. Well, I'm not but singing right. That's why I'm not I singing. I know. I know. I hear that. We're, we're grateful you're here. I think this group can be very helpful for all of us. What we do need is your feedback, and we need your questions. Uh, Jeanette, I really appreciated you submitting that one earlier today. Um, next month, you know, uh, or in two months, what I encourage you to do is begin to think about whether your church is a collie or a cat um, and, and, uh, and then raise the questions about that you have about what does that mean for you and your ministry style and for what you can do at the church because they're radically different things. So if you don't understand that, you have some questions, uh, this is the time to, to put them together and, and we'll submit them to Steve and he can start with there. Uh, with that, and then we can uh, uh, we can go from there. This has been a good uh, good discussion, I think. I hope it's been helpful for you. We'll see you on September thirteenth. Thank Thanks you. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Denny. Thanks, Everybody, Thanks. blessings. Blessings. Good night.